Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everyone here this morning. If you're a visitor, it's especially good to see you, and we appreciate you being here and encourage you to come back anytime you can. Uh, we want you to feel welcome. Before we get started this morning, I'm going to go over a few announcements. Uh, first of all, just encourage you to pick up a bulletin that's out in the lobby so that you have all the current information. It also has names of those who struggle with cancer and other chronic illnesses. If you'll keep them in your prayers, it would be greatly appreciated. And also, just to keep in mind all those who are dealing with COVID and, and flu and everything else that, are, that is uh, pretty rampant right now. Uh, those specifically, uh, Shalina Shumpert had her cast removed. She's dealing still with some uh, complications from that, um, so please keep her in your prayers. Fern Colburn starting to feel better, um, still doing tests and waiting to find out about whether or not she's had a stroke. Dewey Barnes was admitted to the hospital Friday. He's in the ICU of pneumonia. David Gibson and Greg Hogue are preparing to leave for Romania to help with the churches in the UK, Ukraine. So uh, I believe I overheard they're leaving today. So keep them in your prayer for their safety and effectiveness. Uh, this Wednesday, we'll be meeting again for a, a meal before services at 515. The meal is Mexican chicken and chicken nuggets. I uh, encourage you to be here for that if you absolutely can. Ladies, we'll be meeting at 10 a.m. on Thursday for a devotional. I uh, want to remind everyone that this coming Sunday, a week from today, is Daylight Savings Time, so spring forward an hour. Uh, don't forget to set your clocks or you'll be late. I uh, want to thank everyone who's volunteered with the youth training program. Um, if you haven't signed up and would like to, you still can. The next meeting will be this afternoon at 4 p.m., and the focus will be on song leading and speech. If you have any questions, see Chase about that. Uh, the Widowhood Workshop is on April 9th and 10th. Uh, we need volunteers to work the welcome table and help with breakfast and lunch. If you'd like to volunteer, there is a sign-up list that's been placed at the center table. That sounds uh, pretty interesting. I was hoping to get to go, but I won't be able to. And it wasn't because I was planning on planning Shay's death or anything, becoming a widower, but uh, should be some really good information. The website has been updated with the online directory. Uh, it looks pretty nice. If you'd like to check that out, you can do that. Um, the password for it, you can ask Chase uh, about that one and, and, and get all that going. This morning, those who are serving, uh, Zach Goza will be leading singing and doing children's time. Bobby Colburn will have our opening prayer. Scripture reading will be by Ron Marsh. Lord's Supper prayer will be Lance Brown. The closing prayer will be Cameron Kinnave. Are there any other announcements or anything that needs to be said that I missed? If not, let's praise God. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time that you've given us to come here and meet together and study your word and sing songs of praise to you. We pray, Father, that that you enter the, into this worship service with us, that you, your presence be felt by all here. We pray, Father, that uh, you be with the sick that are of our number. We especially pray for my mother, Fern Colburn. It, it, it's, we're so thankful that she's getting stronger, but she still, still has a little ways to go. And we, we pray, Father, for Shalina and all the, comp the complications that she's having, pray that you bless, bless the hands that minister to her. Father, we pray for Dewey Barnes and as he battles pneumonia, and we pray that you bless the people that are taking care of him, that he might, might receive full recovery. Father, we, we thank you for the time that we live in, and we pray for those around the world that that don't know the freedoms that we know. We, we pray that you would bless them, that the church might grow in those places. And we pray for Greg and David as they go, go into another part of the world and, and uh, 
help to spread your word. We pray that many might be saved. Be with us throughout this service and forgive us when we fail you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to have a partner with me on these first few songs, that's okay with y'all. There's Mama right there. Hey. There you go. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Let's praise God. I will call upon the Lord. Song, I'm going to say, you chose us, Father. 
We didn't choose you. We were dead in our sin, and yet you reached out, and you gave your one and only son for us because you loved us above all. So, God, there's nothing we can do to ever repay that, but let us, let us sing to you here. I hope it makes you happy, Father. We love you in Jesus' name. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all created things, above all wisdom and all the ways of man, you were here before the world began. Above all As the gentlemen pass out the Lord's Supper this morning, for the ones that are visiting here, there'll be two cups. Um, you, there'll be uh, the bread in the bottom cup, through the vine in the top. And we'll pray for those as time comes. We ask you now, and you know, the song we just sang, it's hard to follow that when you're thinking about what God did for us. But we ask you to kind of blot out what's going on in, in the world. There's so many negative things in the world right now. But remember, peace comes from Christ coming to die for us. That we may have eternal life in heaven, and that is hope we need to hold on to. Each Sunday we gather around the Lord's table, and it's um, instituted in the Gospels. Luke is one of them, and I thought I'd read that this morning. It's in Luke 22, 
in verse 14 through 20. It says, When the hour had come, he sat down and the twelve apostles with him. And he said to them, With fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he took the cup after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which I shed for you. And that is the example that Christ has set for us, that we should take the Lord's Supper and remember what he has done for each one of us, that we do have hope and that we have a chance to live with and help with him, him in heaven someday. Let's pray for the uh, bread this morning first. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for sending your son to die for each one of us, that we may have forgiveness of our sins because we know we sin. As we remember what Christ did for us, this bread represents his body and everything he went through for us. Help us remember as we take this and thank you for doing this for us. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Father, we continue our prayer to you this morning as we are thinking back to your son and how he suffered and died for each one of us. This fruit of the vine represents his blood that he shed upon that cruel cross for us. Help us to take it that is pleasing in your sight. In Christ's name we pray, amen. As the men come back forward, as we prepare for, for convenience to give back, it is commanded that we give. There's so many things that Grace Point is doing to try to spread the word. We have two members heading to Romania to help with Ukraine. We've got the widow workshop. We're, we're training the young kids um, this Sunday afternoon, uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock. There's so many things that we are doing here, and a lot of things that some of the members may not even know. So this gives us a chance to give back that um, we might be able to continue some of the work that's done here. If you'll pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for everything. Everything comes through you. As we pass this plate, we know it's a commandment to give back to you. We hope that each one of us do, does it in a pleasing manner. And we Hope that we'll be able to spread your word to bring more people to you with, some, with this gift. We ask for your forgiveness because we know we do sin. In Christ's name we pray, amen.
the depth of the riches of God's saving grace, flowing down from the cross for me. There the debt for my sins by the Savior was paid, in his suffering on Calvary. Oh, the depth of such wonderful love, flowing down the Chase is going to preach to us again today, and he's going to talk about being a servant. Who knows what it's like being a servant? What does it mean to be a servant? <coughs> Who knows? Mackenzie? Serving others. Serving others. That's right. You want to say? Um, you, you gave you people um, what they want. Yeah, you help people get what they want, right? You think about helping other people, right? Was Jesus a king? No. Yeah. Yes, he did. <laughs> He's trying to get ahead of me. Jesus was a king, wasn't he? But guess what Jesus did when he came here and he died for us? He became what? Jesus. He became a servant, didn't he? He washed his apostles' feet. He gave to people. He helped to feed them. But you know what he did for us? He died for us, didn't he? You know what he's doing right now? Just like a good servant would, he's up in heaven right now with his father. He's building us all a big, brand new home. Do you want to go to heaven? Who wants to go to heaven? <laughs> Struggling with this at home too right now. I don't want to go up there. It's okay. Listen, y'all come down here, okay? Y'all come down here. Get on your knees. Get on your knees with me. Here's what I want y'all to do for me, okay? Everybody come here and look. Everybody look at me. Everybody look at me. Look up here. I want y'all to be like Jesus, okay? I want y'all to go around all the time. And I want you to look at how you can help somebody else have a better life, okay? If you see somebody that's hurting, somebody that's struggling, go up and give them a hug. 
If you see somebody that needs some food, give them some food. Be there for them, okay? Be like Jesus and love them and tell every one of them that Jesus loves them. Can you do that for me? Can you do that for me? All right. Yes. Yes. All right, everybody, bow your heads, okay? We're talking to a king here, so let's all be real quiet, okay? Let me pray, and after that, we'll sing a song back to our families. You ready? God, we love you so much, and we thank you for loving us. I, I love these kids right here. Thank you for their hearts. Thank you for those that bring them to the church and watch after them. Help us all as a congregation, as a family, to be mentors over these young kids. Keep them from temptation. Keep them from sin. But, Father, whatever we can do to help them, help us to be strong and be mentors to them. We love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go on back. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Amen. Thank you to everybody that brings kids to church. I, I can't say that, but thank you so much for everybody that chooses to try to give them a head start. This world will try to eat them up, and I'm so proud that y'all bring them. Thank you. I love hearing them cry out and yell out in church. Which is usually my kids that are doing it, so. All right, now that they're getting riled up, we're going to sing this song now, okay? This is one of my favorites, all right? However, as we all know in congregation, sometimes they can get a little lost, okay? So here's what I want to do. I'm going to ask y'all, please sing it, okay? I say it all the time. We're not singing for ourselves. We're not singing this after. We're singing to God Almighty. We're singing to the Savior that saved us from our sins. So find your part. Sing out. Close your eyes if you have to. Just not think about people around you. But sing out. What I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the mic off just to get everybody started. I'll turn it off because I don't want us to all be one together here, okay? I'm going to start it off. Love one another. Amen. Everybody, please stand for the reading of God's Word.
This morning's scripture reading will come from Matthew chapter 12, starting with verse 15. Matthew 12, starting with verse 15. To set the stage, Jesus had just healed a man on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are starting to plot to kill him. Verse 15. Aware of this, Jesus withdrew from that place. Many followers followed him, and he healed all their sick, warning them not to say, who he was. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. Here is my servant whom I have chosen, the one I love, in him I am delighted. I will put my spirit on him, and he will proclaim justice to all nations. He will not quarrel or cry, he will not quarrel or cry out. You will not hear his voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, a smoldering wick he will not snuff out, until he leads justice to the victory. In his name, the nations will put their hope. You may be seated. Amen. Good morning, church. Good morning. Thank you for all the men that have served today. Thank you, members and visitors alike, for being here. I don't tell you often enough, but I try and tell you every time I thank to. I love you. As Zach said, I love the young children here, too. We can't help it. We're so full of kids. If you're upset with kids, I don't know if you'll uh, find much joy here because we got a bunch of them. Uh, but I, I love them, too. And as Zach said, thank you for bringing them. It really does make a huge difference in their life to get that head start, like he said, to learn how to cultivate a servant heart in yourself. And we're doing that, as Lance mentioned, in his uh, time up here. We are training our young children right now. Uh, that youth training program we've got going on, I believe we've got a special treat here tonight as well. So speech and song leading will be our points of emphasis tonight. So if you've got a teen or young kid that would like to learn how to present a lesson or lead a song, we need the future generations of the church to carry the torch, and we're going to train them to do exactly that. So come back at 4, and we'll have a fun time there. A little sweet treat after afterwards so come back at least for that but we're continuing with our study of the life of Christ and it was Ron as Ron said we see him now dealing with threats against his life the Pharisees and other religious leaders were plotting not to just imprison Jesus not to take him to trial but to kill him his truth was so powerful in that it revealed those without truth that those without truth wanted to end Jesus' life. So he was dealing with this, really, a crisis that any man, uh, any normal man, would have broken under. The pressure that Jesus experiences here is more than any pressure I've ever experienced in my life. And I, I'm a complainer. I, I, I let you know when I'm feeling pressured, okay? Any normal man would have broken under the pressure. But Jesus presses on. In order to avoid his arrest prematurely, he retreats. He withdraws quietly, trying to withdraw quietly, uh, to go with himself, with his disciples. And in spite of his attempts to find moments to rest, what we might overlook here is that Jesus was consumed by crowds everywhere he went. So uh, you may be anxious. Is there an attempted, would there a would-be murderer in the crowd? Is there someone there trying to catch you? Is there someone there trying to hurt you? You're trying to rest. You're trying to recover. You just taught a great lesson. Just performed a miracle. Now more people are coming to you. More people are wanting a miracle from you. Uh, Jesus traveled everywhere uh, in many places. All around Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem, Tyre, Sidon, all around the Jordan River. And everywhere he went, people followed him. And some of the cities that he visited were Gentile cities. So it's safe to assume that there were many Gentiles or non-Jews seeking the truth from Jesus as well. But there were many people who followed Jesus who were sick. And the scripture says he healed them all. It's really easy to forget Jesus' humanity. He was perfect. There was never and will never be another man like him. But men get tired after a long day of work. And men like me get tired and irritable after a long day of work. There's a certain point where I can't put up with people anymore and I get really cranky. Jesus had just spent an entire day dealing with people, the good people and the bad people trying to kill him. He, he was trying to teach them. He was trying to heal them. He was trying to bless them. 
all throughout the night, people were coming to him. Every single one that came to him, he took the time to personally heal. He reached out to them and he healed them. He chose to serve them. And think of the anxiety that any normal man would have been under at this point. He was trying to guard his own life because his ministry was not done yet. He was trying to escape imprisonment. He was trying also to teach those who were trying to kill and imprison him. So think about that pressure. You've got to love your enemies. He was trying to teach them. You've got to deal with every individual who wants something from you. You're still trying to teach them the gospel. You've got your young apostles here. You're trying to form a good group here. You're trying to plan your mission. You can see how much anxiety a normal man would have been feeling here. Any normal person would have broken under the stress. So it's not just another normal, casual day for Jesus. He's battling the forces of the world. And that's just the forces we can see. It doesn't even take into account the forces of evil that the Son of God was putting upon His shoulders as He walked in this mortal plane. He was facing so much in His life, and yet every single time someone came to Him He loved them enough to give of Himself. He did that His entire ministry. Even up to the point of His death, Jesus always chose to be a servant. So don't forget the power of the phrase, the servant of God. Because that's what Jesus truly was. At His very core, His purpose, His mission, His passion was to serve the Father. And if that meant dealing with us, He was willing to deal with us. You and I can't do that. But Jesus always chose service. He always took the time to teach and love the masses. So as we look at Matthew 12, we see how Jesus was the pleasing servant of God. And we see that attributed to Him by God the Father and by other prophecies. Beginning again at your Scripture reading in Matthew 12, We'll look at just verses 15 and 18 here and see how Jesus was the pleasing servant of God. Verse 15 through 18 says, Jesus, aware of this, the threat of his life, withdrew from there, and many followed him, and he healed them all. And he ordered them not to make him known. This was to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, my servant whom I have chosen, my beloved, with whom my soul is well pleased. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And then in Matthew uh, 15, or 12, rather, verses 18 through 21, Matthew quotes a prophecy from Isaiah about the coming servant Christ. But more powerfully here, the term servant used in this text is less servant, and more son. The word used here in this text is more like a servant so beloved by the Master that he has become a son. And you see why that's more fitting for Jesus than just plainly, he's the servant. He's the servant so close to the Master that the Master has called him his son. And we know that Jesus is God's son, but in even his role of service, he acted more as a son than a servant obedient to the Father out of love, rather out of obligation. So he, even deemed by the Father, is called this son servant here in the text, showing how much he was loved. And we see the Jewish interpretation, because they had had this prophecy for a while. The Jewish interpretation of this prophecy made Israel the servant. So for all of these years before Jesus came, they thought Israel was this coming servant of God in whom God was pleased and gave His Spirit. But the revelation here in Matthew is that rather Jesus was the coming servant, not Israel. It was not the Jews, it was Jesus. And the divine authority issued to Jesus affirmed that truth. So Isaiah was speaking about Jesus coming to be the pleasing servant of God, not about Israel being the pleasing servant of God, because at many times they weren't very pleasing to God. Jesus was the ultimate service of God. And the wording here indicates that Jesus was the one that the prophecy originated for. The words are almost identical in Matthew uh, as they are to uh, Isaiah. And the words in Isaiah's prophecy are almost identical to the one that God the Father spoke from the heavens at Jesus' birth and at His transfiguration. This is my Son whom I love. 
I am well pleased in Him. Listen to Him. And then, of course, at Jesus' baptism was when He receives the anointing of the Holy Spirit so that all can know that He has received the divine seal of approval. So Isaiah's prophecy predicted the coming anointing of Jesus with the Holy Spirit, and God the Father fulfilled the prophecy by sending the Spirit when Jesus was baptized. This was a sign given to John the Baptist. It's why he said, there's someone coming with me who will baptize you with the Spirit, not just with water. However, this was more than a sign. This was a message. Jesus was coming to be the ruler of God's kingdom. He was coming to be in charge. He was the perfect man for the job. He had all of the qualifications. And yet, he intentionally came to serve. To live his life for those lesser than him in such a way that it placed them above himself. That's what we're called to do. We're not only called to serve others, We're called to serve them in such a way that we view them as more worthy than ourselves. So service is not a thing to do, it's an attitude to have. It's more about humbling yourself than ticking the box. That's where many, like myself, get service wrong. I do service out of obligation, many times. Not, rather, out of a love for my Father. I do service to those because I'm told I have to, not because... I love them enough to do it. That needs to change in the church. I know that needs to change in my hearts and hearts like mine. I need to switch it around. I love you, the lost sinner, enough to inconvenience myself. And really, you're not asking for much. You're asking for life. Isn't giving life a wonderful thing? We should all be pleasing servants of God, looking at the example of the perfect servant. Jesus was the pleasing servant. I'm so proud of Him. I love Him. I'm anointing Him. Listen to the words that the Father uses addressing this servant, His Son. And remember how pleasing He was. And try and attain some of that service yourself. Try and be a servant like Him. And we see now that He is the servant. We begin to see what exactly the servant's job was. And Matthew, among many things, says that Jesus' job as a servant was to be a preacher to the Gentiles. And this is very powerful here from Matthew. We'll look at the second part of verse 18. I will put my spirit upon him, and he will proclaim justice to the Gentiles. So part of being a servant of God, what does that job entail? What's the description? Proclaiming justice to the Gentiles. That's what Matthew records, and that, exemplified by Jesus, is exactly what part of his mission was. Now, ministering to the Gentiles was not only what Jesus came to do. It was just a part of what Jesus came to do. Just in the same way that ministering to the Jews was not only what Jesus came to do. He didn't segregate mankind. Again, if you look back at who he healed, the text says he healed all of them indiscriminately. If you come to me for healing, I'll heal you. That's what Jesus says. If you need truth and justice, I'm the one to deliver it. And Jews, you've received for many years the message of justice. You've received the message of love and grace and mercy. You've been God's chosen people up to this point, but the Gentiles haven't heard that. And now it is my obligation as a servant of God sent to be, to be the one to proclaim justice to the Gentiles. And the fact that Jesus ministered to the Gentiles alone upset many Jews for many reasons. But this point about Gentiles is really powerful. If you examine Jesus' teachings, those recorded at least, there's only two examples of Jesus saying someone has a great faith, and it wasn't a Jewish person. The two people that are at least recorded, he may have said this at other times, but the two people that are recorded that Jesus attributed great faith to were both Gentiles. The persistent widow in Matthew 15 and a faithful centurion in Matthew 8. Great faith was not an attribute of Gentiles. That was exclusive to the Jews. You could not have faith if you were a Gentile according to the Jews. You weren't the right person. And it's not even... 
we see the devils in the details. The Gentiles weren't really bad people. They just specifically weren't the right people. The, the lost people in the world today aren't necessarily bad people if we're thinking like the Jews did. They're just not good enough. That's, uh, try and think the way the Jews did here. The Gentiles, okay, that's fine. You've chosen your sinful ways. You've chosen not to take on our laws and our rules. That's fine, but now you can't have Jesus. They withheld it from the Gentiles. The Gentiles didn't really necessarily do anything other than not being chosen by God to be His chosen people. But now Jesus comes and proclaims the Gospel is for everyone. The Gospel is for all people. And the message specifically that the Gentiles receive is justice. The implication being that for all of the Jewish teachers that had been proclaiming a message to the Gentiles, you haven't been preaching justice to them. You have, rather, been unjust toward them. You, the Jewish people, have been unfair in your dealings with the Gentiles. You are wrong, Jesus says. I proclaim justice to them. I'm coming to save them. I'm coming to redeem them. They have been cast out for far too long. You have shut the doors of the faith and I'm coming to kick them open. I'm coming to preach justice to them. And if they deserve justice, guess, that, guess what that makes you, Jews? The bad guy. So we talked in our adult class about being pharisaical. Here we've got to be mindful of who we exclude from the faith. Hopefully we're not bold enough to tell anyone straight to their face, you can't come to church, you can't accept the faith, but it is by our sin of omission we filter the sinners. I'll tell this uh, honorable, clean, nice-looking sinner about Jesus. But this nasty, filthy, public sinner, I won't tell about Jesus. So by not telling them about Jesus, you've excluded them from the faith. Hopefully someone better than you comes and does it because you're not good enough. You have not proclaimed justice. Jesus came to do exactly that. His blood comes now to cleanse all. His testament replaces the old, bringing it to all men. If anyone locks groups out of the faith, they are unjust. Jesus proclaims justice. But the way He does it is peacefully. Finally, we see Jesus is the peaceful leader. Another element of Jesus' service, and a powerful one, is the spirit He maintains during His ministry. Jesus chose intentionally to lead with love going rather than into the halls of the government, rather than knocking on Caesar's door, he goes into the homes of the people. His method of ministry is intentional here. Look at verses 19-21. through 21. Here's what you won't see Jesus doing. <clears throat> he will not quarrel or cry aloud, nor will anyone hear His voice in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not quench until he brings justice to victory. And in his name, the Gentiles will hope. You see, when Jesus' life was confronted, he didn't stay in the fight. He does at other times, but at this point, he didn't remain in Capernaum to dispute with his enemies. He withdrew until the time was appropriate. And he would not be silenced in the end. And this is not a silencing of Jesus. This is him tactfully withdrawing until the appropriate time to spread the gospel more effectively. He knew what he was doing. They didn't win by kicking him out of the town. He chose to leave. Other times we see him vanish among the crowds. He's got the power and the ability to do whatever he wants. But he chooses, rather than to cry out aloud in the streets. We, of course, by uh, examining the context here, know exactly what that means. He doesn't want to cause a riot. He doesn't want to appear to be a military leader of any sort. So rather than trying to topple the walls of the government, we see in Jesus' teachings... Why do you even care about them? Why do you even worry about them? Give them what they want and give God what He wants. I've not come to do battle with Rome. 
I've not come to become this great military leader, this great public figure that people follow just so they can uh, f f uh, fulfill their bloodlust. I'm not here to cause a war. Other times, there's going to be points of division. Father against son, daughter against mother. My truth will be a sword at times. There's still power in the truth that Jesus preaches here, but the methodology, the way in which he administered the gospel is intentional here. He wasn't a warmonger. You didn't have to bow to him at the threat of death. He wanted you to choose him. So the way he went about that was intentional. And it, the words here implicate the Pharisees. Because the Pharisees, if we remember from other examples, loved for their voices to be heard in the streets. Oh, here comes brother so-and-so screaming out loud how much better he is than all the sinners. Jesus wasn't like that. You won't hear his voice in the streets. He's not going to quarrel. He's not going to cry aloud. He's not going to be silenced. He will always speak truth. But he's not going to act like a child screaming for attention like you Pharisees. And then Matthew issues words of comfort. I'll put them up again. He issues words of comfort for the Gentiles. A bruised reed he will not break, and a smoldering wick he will not clench. This addresses the gentle nature of Jesus here, but the reed and the wick are the Gentiles. A bruised reed, a, a rod of grass, tilting over, been beaten by a passing animal or, or the wind, ready to snap at any moment. Jesus is gentle enough to not cause it to break. And a smoldering wick, the wick of a candle, Jesus won't extinguish. A dying flame, Jesus won't snuff out. The bruised reed and the smoldering wick were the Gentiles, and they received their bruises, and they lost their spark because of the Jews. What this is saying here from Matthew's account here, if you've been hurt by Jews before, Jesus is not that type of Jew. You are safe when you come to Him. Because maybe, perhaps, you've come to a priest before and you've just gotten chewed out. You've tried to uh, search for grace and mercy and you've just found hatred and disgust. You can come to Jesus. He'll not break you in half. He'll not extinguish your flame. He won't stop until He brings your justice to victory. He is a source of comfort and strength for all people, but especially those who are hurt. When people who are hurt come before you, do you even see their pain? Do you hurt them? Do you break the rod? Do you quench the flame? I'm talking to myself as much as I'm talking to you in your ministry. If you even minister, how do you treat the broken people? Jesus says, I'm bringing your justice to victory. And that's great news because you're the broken person, by the way. I'm the broken person, by the way. We're not Jews here. We're Gentiles. We're the outcasts. We're the unlovable. We're the ones who are not good enough. We're the wrong person to save. And Jesus says to you, I promise victory. I'll give you my life now. I'll give you my death if you want it. And I'll give you a new life a rebirth with me that you can experience at any time. I'll heal all people. You just have to come to me. I'll never turn you away. The Gentiles would have to change their lives. Jesus didn't permit their sin to come into the church. You would have to live righteously and obey Jesus' commands if you came to Him. Accepting the Gentiles does not mean accepting the lives of the Gentiles, but the person. He didn't accept their way of life. For those seeking the truth, Jesus offers a safe place to be guided to the truth. I will not expel you for your past sins. If you remain in sin, that's fine. You weren't seeking the truth. Be on your way. Choose your own life. But if you want to be encouraged, if you want to be uplifted, if you want to be comforted, you can come to me. And I'll give you grace and mercy as you find the truth. That same level of generosity that Jesus shows here is the same manner in which we should treat the sinners of the world. Again, of which we are one. We're sinners. So how can we condemn sinners without condemning ourselves? To share the good news is to share Jesus. To tell people about the service of Jesus 
is to tell them about how they can be served by him. He is the servant of God. Everything he did, everything he embodied and was and continues to be, that's the good news. But in your sharing of Jesus, which again, I hope you do, the best way to share him is to live like him. You can't be someone who shares Jesus if you don't know Jesus. And if you don't know Jesus, you're not going to know how to act like him. If you're not a servant yourself, if you don't have a servant heart yourself, you're not going to count others as greater than yourself and you're never going to serve anybody. And the greatest disservice you can do is to not tell somebody about Jesus. But the greatest thing you can do is share him with someone. The greatest thing you can do is say, Jesus is your servant. Jesus has come to live and die for you so that you can live and die and be resurrected again in him. Jesus wasn't corrupted by his deity. It rather drove him into greater service and greater power and greater encouragement. His message is filled with humility and service, but his life is the perfect example of what that should look like. Today, find that servant heart. Serve God, love God, ask Jesus to give it to you. And if you're a smoldering wick, if you're a bruised reed, come to Jesus and he will comfort you. If you need to be baptized into Jesus' blood for forgiveness of sins, for a new life, or if you need help in your service, in being a humble servant, and we can pray for you, please come if there's any need while we stand and sing to encourage you. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
Let us pray together. Our holy and righteous Heavenly Father, we humbly come before Thee now to thank You once again for this wonderful and beautiful day that You've blessed us with. Father, we thank You for the opportunity You've given us this morning to gather together and sing songs of praise into Your name and to hear more of your, from Your Word. At this time, Father, we pray that You be with those affected by the craziness going on in this world. We pray that Your guiding light will be seen in, the, in their darkest hours that they find You and that in all things Your will be done. We pray that You be with uh, us as we depart here this this morning to go back into our homes, back out into the world, that we travel safe, and that you be with everyone as the weather passes through this afternoon. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. <laughs> 